welcome back to another episode of Fret Buzz the Podcast. A podcast for musicians focusing on how we musicians and professionals approach our craft, giving insight to help us all become more informed and better musicians. Hi, I'm your host, Aaron Sefcik, and this week we're going to get into part two with Jens Larsen, all about jazz guitar. Real quick before we start today's show, hit that subscribe button. And as well, head on over to iTunes and give us a review. More importantly, if you really enjoy Fret Buzz the podcast, share an episode. That is where it's at. Spread the word. And with that, let's jump into part two with Jens Larson on Fret Buzz the podcast. So. You have this whole, you have a video about getting a, a good jazz tone from any amp um, that I watched at some point. Um, mm-hmm. So as much as the guitar, I do feel like the, the amp has almost equal importance in your overall tone, but you, you managed to get a good sound out of a bunch of different stuff, like an AC30 and a some sort of Marshall, like a, did you use a JCM 800 or something? Yeah, that was, I mean, I think the Marshall was the one that was the most surprisingly the most difficult because actually I, I played marshals that I thought were really really easy to play with but this one was really bright um, but I think the I, I, I mean I think the amp is important definitely and I also think one thing is getting what you consider to be an okay jazz tone like that and then the other, another thing is actually finding the tone where where you really think okay this is gonna be my tone and I really like it and it, it's gonna work when I play, I think that that's another story, to be honest. But um, but yeah, I think you can you can do that. I think the the thing that nobody ever really teaches people, and that's also a kind of ear training, is this idea that you actually can hear the different frequencies uh, involved in a good tone. That uh, people will say, well, it has to be jazz, so it has to have a lot of, lot of bass, which is just completely untrue. <laughs> So I've actually went into a store once and they said, well, oh, you want to play jazz, but then you need to buy a bass amp. I was like, so then, then I had to try a bass amp. It's the worst thing I've ever tried. <laughs> so so for me, I mean, the, I think a lot of the, the great classic jazz records are made with fingers. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's it's basically twang amps. And it's it's all about how you set it up and then, then that you make sure to well, I think especially cut out enough low end and cut it out, out, out enough highs and then really focus on getting the right kind of mids. I think that's, and I think you can do that with, if, with a bit of searching, you can do that with most amps. I mean, the video that I made, of course, was made together with a recording engineer and a record producer who just really knew those amps. Mm. So we didn't agree completely on what you wanted for tone, but he would always just be like, oh, it has to be this, this, and this, and then it works. Like, so it's not so difficult. <laughs> well, but what, he's also thinking like that. He's already fine-tuned to re- recognizing this is too much high end, this is too much compression there, or this is too much low end, or you know, I mean, stuff that that I I try to train myself in getting. I'm getting better at it now, also both with both with just guitar tone, but also just with like record production. That you can actually hear compression and stuff like that. I couldn't hear it really in the beginning. I could hear it sounded funny, but I couldn't really hear what it was. So now I can go like, okay, this is compression gone wrong. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, so. Well, what amp would you, what do you gig with? Like, what is your, or what would you like to gig with if you had, you know, any choice? Well, actually, I, I gig with mostly with, um, with with what I would like to use also uh, because uh, I'm I'm using a modeling amp. Oh. <laughs> I find that really really practical and it sounds. Uh, what my my choice of amp is usually like I also have a, an old Fender Twin, mm-hmm. and th- that is pretty much what I really really like. Of course, with a Fender Twin, it's like to get it to really feel nice. It, it's always too loud. It doesn't really matter what kind of music you play. It's always just too loud. So it's just not practical to actually gig with that one. And then one of the things I do a lot is also I play a lot of school concerts. So that means that I'm often playing in situations where it's like me and the bass player and a saxophone player and a singer for a hundred kids that are like five years old. Yeah. So that's 
that's a certain kind of volume and that is not the kind of volume where you get a nice compression from a fender twin that's just the way it is so so the, the whole i'm using a, a fractal audio x8 uh, which is just like the floor floor version of the xfx and that really works well for me because i can get that kind of feel but i can turn it down mm. and another thing that i found and which was probably the main reason why i changed um, was that in general when you play a lot of festivals then uh, a lot of especially the smaller festivals in europe that i played at then they will hire a huge pa and they will of course hire the band to come and play but the guy sitting they'll hire the equipment but the guy sitting behind the knobs who's the sound engineer is just the guy with the biggest stereo at home so <laughs> so sometimes i would come there and i would be playing and we would be playing really straight ahead jazz and i would be bringing my like my my gibson es 175 and that and i would still sound like john frusciante in the pa and that was so frustrating <laughs> i hated that so much and that was purely just because people have also just people who are not paying attention with uh, sound engineers and they may be really good at pop music but then they're not good at jazz they they will just do what they always do and then and then what should be fred green sounds like sex machine from Janet Brown or something you know it's like it's just just doesn't work and what I found weirdly was that when I then when I bring the XFX they don't have to put a microphone in front of it no. they get this DI mm -hmm. and I guess it's just sort of a pattern interrupt or something so they just they don't have like oh I have to do this and this and this with EQ and then it's screwed up so they will just go okay how does it sound and then they don't mess with it huh. that's been a huge game changer for me actually which is a, a weird place to have that game changer but it's it, it really is not a lot do you, is there a reason you don't i mean i i understand that the twin is got a great sound when it's loud but like i use a princeton reverb and that's too small for certain situations but you know why not have a deluxe and it for for maybe not the festivals where you have a, a pa like you know house sound guy but do you not ever try to just use a smaller amp that you can turn up until it compresses properly well i i think at, at the time where i chose to, to go with with a fractal audio it was like i wanted to use effects so i needed to get either something that would do the effects and and the amp sound uh, or i would need to get an amp and some effects and that investment was just going to be bigger and then it was a gamble at the time i was like i didn't know really but so so I went with the XFX and then 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 I just really liked it and then it's like then there's no reason to go with the other one if I just need and if I'm going somewhere and I'm uh, and I'm flying I can't bring an amp mm -hmm. but my X8 I can just throw that in the luggage it, it, it can handle it yeah. so I can just bring that and then just just use the effects and then I can easily play on any kind of uh, situation so for me it's just it's for now it's just convenience I sometimes think it's nice to use a real amp um but but the difference is so small to yeah. be honest yeah the, the, they've gotten so good at modeling nowadays it's it's pretty it's not a perfect but it is damn close and like you said it's it's it really comes down to the convenience factor the fact that you can just throw it in your backpack or whatever like that and honestly once you get to the gig and all you have to do is just you know hand them a a cable <laughs> there's no yeah. miking there's no feedback problems there's no it's and you already have all the levels set the way you like them everything's you know gain staged perfectly it's just convenient it's just so much less of a headache to deal with um, obviously amps are great and when you're in a studio situation and recording you you would want to use an amp to try to get that pure sound um, but you know, a modeling amp could <laughs> could go pretty well. I mean, yeah, I mean, when I work at home, of course, I, I do. I use the X8, of course, because I can also just plug it into the computer. Yeah. So it's it's for the videos and stuff. It's, it works perfectly as well. Yeah. Um, it's just and fast. also, the, the, actually, one thing that I find is a, is my problem with Fender amps often is the open back thing, because hmm. that means that we have all this low end that's sort of going everywhere. And, and that, that's hard to work with. And I didn't try that out, actually. I did try that out with other amplifiers. 
Um, but some of the places when I'm playing in schools, we're playing like in in um, in sports halls and stuff like that, and the acoustics there are like crazy bad, <laughs> horrible, you know. So any kind of issue I would have with something like that is it's nice to be able to take that away. And here I can just eat you that out. If it's a problem, it's gone. But you cannot do that with an open back cabinet. Hmm. Really, that so that would be something where. And I don't know how it is because I never really did that. We did all those concerts, I, concerts where I was already going with with the XFX. But I played a hundreds of you know, uh, concerts for that, and it, it's always it's always worked in that way. And I would imagine that to be a huge disadvantage for me personally. And I bet you've never had a fan come up to you and say, "I can't believe you're not using an amp," <laughs> because to them it all just sounds it all sounds the same. <laughs> I don't. I think I've. I've been, no, I didn't have in, in the, um, the like now I'm using the X8. Before I was using the the fractal audio, the, the XFX, which is like a rack unit, yeah, yeah. and then my controller was like a Behringer something. And I've had quite a few sound engineers go look, not looking at what was behind them, just looking at the Behringer and then going like, "You're using that?" <laughs> because <laughs> I don't know how it is when you where you are, but Behringer does not have a great name no, around here. <laughs> no, they do, they do not. <laughs> <laughs> so, but usually. What I've had is when I get skepticism, especially if I play larger venues and larger festivals where people actually know what they're doing, you know, mm. with the sound in news. But I, I, or they have been polite or they've never told me, like, yeah, I don't like it. Yeah. They were usually I get like, this man, this sounds good, you know, this this really works. Yeah. So so for that I think it's 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 good. I don't know. It, it was a gamble for me and it paid off. And I don't think I'm planning on changing it actually. Yeah anytime soon. I don't know, maybe I feel like doing it, then I'll do it, but it, it would be that. It wouldn't be because I have to or because I think it's better, really. Yeah. I, I cannot imagine that the audience can tell. Yeah. Our last episode, we actually recorded um, with a guy who his entire band only uses the Helix, or at least for <laughs> the instrumentalists. And he was, he was really talking about how he, you know, some of the details of how he gets it to sound like a real amp. And it's... It's a little complex, but it it has good results in the end. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it actually wasn't for the X fix. It wasn't that difficult. Of course, you do need to to make sure that you get a good speaker, mm. and that's not like you don't go and buy the most expensive effects unit and then the cheapest PA speaker you can find. That's just not gonna work. Mm -hmm. But but it, with the stuff that I have, I, I bought these QC monitors, and they they've really done the job it's okay hmm. so yeah for and also for anything i do and i never need to bring anything else if i do a soul gig or if I do a rock gig a musical it's always the same and well, actually, you, most of the time it's one patch also <laughs> well you, you mentioned you plugging your your um axe effects or your mm -hmm. fractal it's directly into the computer to record i think it's not a bad time to transition into your online, uh, what do you call it? You're you're almost like an online celebrity amongst guitarists, at least around here. Yeah. Um, people will come up to me and they'll be like, "Have you?" Some of my students, especially my adult students, they'll be like, "Have you seen this? Any of Jens Larsen's stuff online?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, absolutely. I've got his book and I've got, and you know, you've been on our schedule for a while coming up, and I've been excited about it." Yeah. Yeah, as but, soon as Joe said something, I was like, yeah, of course I know Jens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that from my perspective, you have some of the clearest, most immediately applicable lessons in the jazz guitar world that you can find online. They're just, they're very accessible. Your free material is, is awesome. Um, so I, I think that that must play some part in your, your success here, but when when did you decide to try to get into the online world, and how did you start going about doing that? It was kind of a, it's like most things also with the M is it's a random thing almost because, like I said, I was done with conservatory and I was doing a lot of gigs and, and I had my band and we were also doing some concerts and stuff. But when I was teaching, it was only like. ACDC, Metallica, Lennon Skinner, Katy Perry, you know, and that's, that was, that's cool, but it's also not what I, I'm educated to do. And I really felt like teaching jazz as well. 
And so one thing I, I found out was that on my website, the thing that people came to check out on my website, and that was no surprise to me, was really when you thought about it, was the transcriptions I had up there of solos, because they're interesting to everybody. They're, they're, you're not going to go check out some random guitar player and his music somewhere on the web. That doesn't really happen. So, so then, then I, I thought, well, maybe if I start maybe making some lessons for my website, then, then I can get some more traffic or maybe, maybe I can get like next year, I'll get one more guy at our concerts every time or something like that. You know, it's, it's just like, okay, we'll try and I can also just, I have all these things that I think nobody's teaching or nobody's teaching it in this way. And I want to teach in that way. Cause I think that just made a difference for how I understood it when I learned it like that. So th that was that. Then I started first with just making blog posts, and uh, I was posting them over on uh, this website, this Russian website called Ultimate Guitar. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that was kind of how that started, and then um, then it, it actually got most of it got received really well over there, and also like a lot of the people that I um, that I still talk to and know from sort of the YouTube world, we're also posting over there. So uh, Chris Super, you know him? Mm -hmm. Australian uh, guitar player. I don't. And but... Ben Eller. Mm -hmm. They were posting over there as well. So we were a few people that the kind of use. And Chris was really the one who told me, like, man, you have to do video. <laughs> you know, the stuff you're doing is great. And I think it's really interesting. But it's going to work so much better if you have a YouTube channel. And at that time, he was he had like 25,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel. He does like a lot of solo lessons, uh, checking out how to how to play anything from Pantera to Van Halen, all that stuff. And um, and then then I was sort of thinking a little bit about that. And I just thought, well, what the heck, I'll just try, take my mo mobile phone. So somewhere on my channel, there's like this really old lesson on shell voicings, which is like, 15 minutes of complete awkwardness. <laughs> but, uh, it's fine, but, uh, but yeah, it, it is what it is. <laughs> and, uh, and that was kind of how I started that. And then I was thinking, well, how do you do this? And then I, was, I watched one lesson somewhere where somebody was talking about, well, if you want to make, make it on YouTube, you have to be consistent. Hmm. So you have to make a lesson every week. And then I thought, well, okay, well, let's try that. And that really worked. And that was how that happened. And then all the other stuff was like, I mean, the good thing is, if you're a musician, if you're a jazz musician, you're used to practicing, and you're used to doing that every day. So being consistent with something is not like a giant leap. Yeah. And being able to make one video at the time, now it takes me really long to make a video because you get nerdy about it. But at the time, it didn't take me that long. And I also had like a ton of things that I wanted to talk about. So the first year of making videos with my phone I spent maybe one or two hours on a video and then I would just upload it and then it would get like a few hundred views and I was happy. It wasn't monetized or anything. I was just thinking, oh, this is fun and people were signing up. And then all, all of that sort of gradually you think, well, maybe it can become more and maybe I should get like a, an, an extra camera. And, and then, then sort of slowly it just evolved into what it is now where it's it's becoming one of them. Well, it's becoming the thing that everybody knows me for, which I guess, I mean, I guess it's among guitar players. I don't really get that so much. I get sometimes people will come up to me in the street. That will happen sometimes, but not, but not so often. For the rest, I don't feel it because the other jazz people around me don't really know about it. Right. It's not something that's among the other instrumentalists that I'm around, my, my colleagues. So, yeah, so so that's that's just how that that works. But I, I mean, I know I have a lot of subscribers, and both on my mailing list and stuff like that. And it's become a thing where, um, I mean, you want to do something where you can really get people to learn in an easier way than than how I had to learn it. That I think that's the main thing. Also, just okay, how do you actually explain this in a way so that you can you can look at it and go like, okay, I get the principle and then i can take this away and, and start working on it but you can also hear like we talked about earlier this is for adults in that way it's from people who are analytical because i can't make a video where i'm like okay we're gonna be playing take the a train for three weeks and and you have time to learn it by ear but but at the same time at least i, I didn't figure out how to do that yet 
So, so it, it is it is like that, but it, it does make a difference to to that. And I can just get to think about jazz stuff, which is what I like to do. <laughs> <laughs> do you do any live sessions? YouTube. I've done a few, um, but it's it's been it's been difficult. Actually, when I tried that. Like now I also have a video editor because I went to making three videos every week, which is also like an ambitious schedule. And, at the, and I start, when I started doing that, I, I'm, I mean, I'm still gigging. I'm still teaching at the conservatory and, and I have a family. That's a lot. So it's, it's like that was getting a little bit much. And then I tried the live thing a little bit, but I didn't really get to it. Uh, and I didn't really like it that much. And I think I want to do it again yeah. at some point also because now I, now I have an edit. So now I'm outsourcing some stuff there's i still need to figure out how to do that i have no idea how to do that yet but um but if i can free up a little bit more time then that would definitely be something i do i probably i'll do that like i have a facebook group where where people that are a little bit more interested can also just join in and and it's also a place to post videos if you want to have some feedback or if you find something nice somewhere and stuff you know it's just like a community around it but on facebook that would be sort of an obvious place to try it out also feel safe for me <laughs> youtube live i don't know <laughs> comments uh, it's, a, it's a rough game <laughs> yeah, the truth. so yeah i don't know i i, I don't actually care it's, i mean i've been on youtube long enough if, if somebody tells me i'm stupid i'll i'll leave <laughs> <laughs> with your lessons do you i've you have lessons for sale online but there do you have any full courses uh, not yet, but uh, that that is definitely coming. Uh, I need to solve a few problems with my uh, not problem. I need to figure out how to do that technically on my website, mm-hmm. um, and I need to make the calls. And then that's definitely something I'm I'm looking into. I didn't do that. like I've done small lessons because like small downloads. That was the first idea I had, and a big part of what makes this possible for me is that I have a Patreon page. Mm-hmm that supports me. And that's, that's been huge for me to be able to do that. That's the reason why I quit working at a music school also next to the conservatory and just could focus on, on doing the online thing. And, um, and in that I'm also using the smaller lessons. That's a part of the thing that the people get access to. So I, I'm, I didn't change that yet, but an online course is definitely something I would like to do. Also just to try and find something where you can give like a longer, longer arc to it. And people need to also commit to it in that way, because that's just so difficult. Like making YouTube videos in a series, it just never works. Yeah. It's too. That's just not how you consume YouTube. You consume YouTube. You look for something. You want to have a, a, a sort of a complete, independent piece of information that you can take away. And a course with ten lessons or something, even though people will request it in the in the comments once in a while. My experience is that whenever I do stuff like that, it doesn't really, I've tried it a few times. It doesn't really work to make four or five episodes on something. Hmm. So yeah, so an online course is definitely uh, in, in the planning. Hmm. Yeah, wonderful. Um, I mean, obviously your book is for everybody out there, Matt, Modern Jazz Guitar Concepts is a, is a pretty, pretty great grab. I'm working my way through it slowly. Oh, I think I'm on chapter three or four, the one using the harmonic minor over the five chord. Yeah. Um, I love that sound. Flat I, nines. It, it's it's perfect for, for, I mean, but it's, it's just the sound of a minor dominant really, or like a dominant in a minor key. But mm-hmm. yeah, and, and um, so you have that book and the second book that I wrote called Advanced Jazz Guitar Concepts. Okay. It came out in July. Oh, is that also the same publisher, Fundamental yeah. Changes? Yeah. Okay. Someday when I fit, when I finally get through this one, <laughs> slow going. There's no need to rush through this kind of thing. No, but I think also, I mean, these, this book and that you have, and also the second book are really made for being so the chapters are independent. So in that way, they, they kind of have a little bit the thing of the YouTube that is like you can just take this one topic and then go into that. If you feel like working on some chordal harmony or something, that's a chapter for that. You can go into that, and you don't need to look at the other ones necessarily. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's still like a, especially in, in the first book, the modern jazz guitar concept, there is some progression in there where it might be easier if you start at the beginning. 
but if you're already familiar with with the way of thinking and can play some songs then probably you can start anywhere in the book you want to and yeah, exactly. also because we learn we learn in different ways and especially if you're not in some sort of curriculum if you're not in a school then there should be some freedom to also just go by what you feel like working with mm. i don't know how you guys work with it for me it's that's been a huge part of what i've always always done i just find stuff that i feel interested in and i'll just work on that for some time and then take something else and then be, be free with that say like for instance if you heard a solo that had some great diminished lines you just decide to focus on diminished for for the day in your practice session i think i'll do longer longer periods of that but yeah yeah okay yeah like uh this morning that's probably going to be the topic for me for practicing uh this morning i heard this kevin hayes solo kevin hayes is a piano player i don't know if you know him he played with chris potter um i came across this solo that he's playing where he was doing some stuff also actually with diminished and a lot of triad stuff but i was like wow this uh this is interesting <laughs> so so that's probably gonna be something that's that i'm gonna dig into at least and how long will you be able to sit down and devote to your practice today uh today um not a lot actually because uh i I was. I have to finish. The, I had to finish the video for tomorrow, and um, then, um, then I was. I had this appointment with you guys. And I had to shoot a video for the patrons, mm -hmm. uh, and tonight um, I have sort of a dinner appointment with a good friend of mine who is a guitar player from Iceland who's here on tour. So uh, I practiced this morning, like just some technique and stuff, and then I did some stuff for the Patreon lesson, and, and then that's it. If you had one hour to practice, could you break down your where you would, how you would divide up your time, in an ideal day where you wanted to hit, you didn't have a gig that night, you just had, wanted to work on a few things. I think, yeah, I can. I mean, I think most of it's it's kind of simple actually for me because um, if most of my practice is really just that that I, I have a technique thing that I do, which is. It's not always completely the same. We also have a video on from a few years ago, and it essentially it's the same thing. So it's just warming up, uh, first playing just a chromatic scale across the neck, then playing. Um, I always play everything through twelve keys. That's just then you have it's like a set amount of exercises you have to do, and you can just create some variation with it. So I'll first take um, what do I do first? Actually, I do the seventh chords arpeggios over the entire neck just up and down, essentially, from the lowest to the highest note. Mm -hmm. I choose one type, of, uh, one type of chord every day, and it's a bit random. I'll just take something and then just play that through all 12 keys. Triads, all 12 keys. Uh, then open voice triads. I'll play some stuff with that because that's really good for your right hand. It kind of coming out of the bluegrass thing, actually. So, so I'm really, I really like the, the idea of working on your alternate picking with the open voice triads because it's just so annoying <laughs> it sounds really good but it's just so annoying to work on but it's so difficult it's not annoying it's just difficult and then you, you can work on that and you really warm up your right hand yeah and and, mm -hmm. and, that's, that's really and then i go into um playing scales and exercises and scales again right now i'm not doing in positions i sometimes do positions but the period i'm in now i'm just doing lowest to highest notes uh, and then just start with first playing the scale lowest to highest notes then some sort of exercise. And, and for me, a big ping, thing with, with, um, with improvisation is developing flexibility and being able to come up with new things, hear new things through on the guitar. So I'll first play the scale and then I'll just take some sort of exercise. It can be like playing triads in a pattern, seventh chords, drop two voicings, whatever. Just play that in that scale of the neck, lowest to highest and then down again. And I, often try to just come up with stuff that I didn't really do before so that I have to um, I kind of have to come up with it on the spot a little bit. I have to sort of solve the problem while I'm playing it. And what I found is that very often, especially if you're doing more simple exercise, and I found that really useful for my students also, that if you have to think about that you're playing diatonic triads in a scale, then that's really difficult because it's just like, this is the third note in the scale, and then I need the third of that one and three, and this, this gets complicated. But if you just play by ear, and it's a simple melody, 
then you can just hear it. So you, you kind of try to learn to play simple melodies through the scale. And I do that all 12 keys, different things. And, and it, like, yeah, you can check out that video if you want to see some of the things that I do. It's all like trial patterns and seventh chord arpeggio patterns and, and stuff like that. Do you remember the name uh, of the, the title of the video for our listeners? My Guitar Practice Routine 2017. Awesome. That's what it's called. So, um, so I'll do that. And then for the rest, and now of course I do this sort of with, with a metronome on some two and four slow setting usually. And um, then I'll just play songs, essentially. Then I'll just sit down and just play a song. That's like, especially if, I was, if, the, if there's a song I'm working on. Uh, and for the rest, yeah, just try and, t and take some some tune, try and play on it, whatever I, I feel like I'm working on. If I'm working on these things with triads, I'll mess around with that. Mm. Um, what I also spend a lot of time on is that I'll put the metronome on something strange. So maybe not oh, strange, but um, maybe on the dotted quarter note or uh, on the two end or something, just just to to work with with that as well. And then that's really what I do. And of course, if I'm working really intensely on something that's difficult with the triads or something like that, then I won't do like really crazy metronome stuff. It's like you, you focus on what you need to do. <laughs> yeah. I think that's incredibly, incredibly helpful for people to hear like a, a very structured practice session and start to incorporate that into their own yep. practicing. And you can, you know, you can practice less and get more out of it mm -hmm. if you're smart about how you practice yeah I, th I think for me at least the the whole thing about being sort of open-ended about your technique that you don't always do the same has been been really useful also that you're just always trying to just change things up a bit it's like okay i've done this a million times let's just add a leading out or something mm -hmm. so, uh, and and that 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 i definitely can recommend to anybody so do you have any big big concerts coming up that you are actually practicing specifically for? Uh, not really. I have a, I still have to get the date, but I have a dual recording with a singer where mm -hmm. I need to practice some stuff. But it's mostly going to be like standards. But I still, because it's duo and I still have to play solos, then I have to practice. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just going to be some pretty sort of basic songs like How Deep Is Your Ocean and uh, gentle rain and I forgot there was one, but there are some. I still need to start working on. We have it's a few weeks from now, probably. We need to fix the date exactly, but that's that's the biggest thing I have coming up right now. For the rest, I'm, I mean, this is the first of September, and tomorrow the conservatory starts, so mm. I'm in meetings all week. <laughs> so that's 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 the first thing I need to get through. <laughs> <laughs> What are the biggest venues that you have played? I mean, any what what is the most meaningful show you've ever played? Um, well, we played. There are a few bigger jazz venues uh, in in, uh, in Holland or in the Netherlands. Uh, the biggest ones in, in Amsterdam is Bimhuis, and then there's one that's of a similar size called Lantan Finster in Rotterdam. And when we presented our third CD with the My Band Travin. Uh, then we did that in Lantern Finster. And that was that was a sort of a big moment in that way. And it was a really comfortable gig to play because we'd spent a long time on the record and we'd already kind of toured with the repertoire also. So we could really it really felt like we could show what it was supposed to sound like. Sometimes I don't know how how that uh, feels but for a lot of, I mean, jazz is not really produced. So the music grows when you play it. And very often when you hear recordings, they didn't first tour the material, which was to some degree also true for, for a lot of stuff that we did, but we did try it out a bit more. We needed to do that. But, but you have this thing that you listen to the record and then when you hear them live, it's evolved so much that it's just always going to be yeah. 10 times as good. And and it, that was how that felt to do that concert. So that was, that was a huge moment for me, I think. And I think another for my for me another sort of big moment was when when I was still in school, and Michael Brecker was um, 
uh, giving a masterclass and visiting then I played a concert with him that was also a, a big thing at the time also just because it was for a jazz concert with like 500 people that mm -hmm. that's big so <laughs> yeah um, is there anywhere you would like to play you know dream gig no, not not so much actually. I mean, I played in Bim House, I played in on Town so the big venues and stuff. It could be fun to play in in sort of the big venue in um, in Copenhagen because I never played there, you know, which is called Copenhagen Jazz House. Um, but uh, but I played. I mean, I played on also the bigger festivals in Copenhagen. We did with with my band. We did a tour in Canada. By now, it's like six years ago, five years ago. So we we tried some of that as well. We've done a lot of touring around in, in, in Europe also, and yeah, I mean then we we've tried a lot of things with that. So so in that way, it's not so much thing. I think the there is a video of us playing um, playing one of my songs for a television show also in here in Holland, which was which was a huge experience, but maybe not necessarily a very uh, positive experience. Um, I mean, it's because it's very stressful, <laughs> potentially, right. and also because the, they were. It was not live. It, it was. It's recorded live, obviously, but it it was not live on television. Um, but the act before us were having trouble, so uh -huh. they took two to three times as long, which meant that we had like one shot, right. Right. <laughs> and that that was. The, that, and they told us that also, and afterwards the. The guy who has the TV show, which it's a program about music, it's a fairly serious program, uh, but he interviewed me about the wrong album. <laughs> <That was. laughs> it's like we really just released an album and then he, he interviewed me about it, the music from the previous album. <laughs> it's very strange. <laughs> oh my. With, uh, and I, I want to be respectful of your time, but before we do end, uh, I do want to ask, because you've mentioned a couple times, albums and your band and whatnot like that. And to me, uh, I'm a studio rat. I love the idea of the studio. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about um, your, well, first of all, your band? Because um, I am very interested in the band and, and, and what you guys do um, and your albums. But at the same time, the, the studio end and really the composition and how you guys um, create the songs and how that, that process goes and how you specifically come up with ideas and, and, and what, how you bring that to the band. Yeah. So that's, I mean, with the band, so my band is called Trabin and it's essentially it's a quartet. So it's tenor saxophone, guitar, bass and drums. Mm -hmm. And I write 90, 95% of the music. So I, I, I write almost everything. Mm -hmm. And I think the way I write music is probably that I will have a really clear idea about the melody and how I want to play it. And then the next thing I'll try to imagine is probably what the drums need to do. And then in between that idea, so I have an idea about what I need to tell the drummer. For me, the drummer is, is in, in that respect, the connection between me and the drummer is the most important thing. Um, so, so that's how I'll, I'll, I'll bring that to the band. And then essentially what they get is very close to just like a lead sheet. Okay. What you would find in that because it's just a melody and some chords and it doesn't really make too much sense. Like the guitar part will probably be a lot more elaborate, but it doesn't really make, give them any information to have that. So I'll just give them the melody and the chords and then, then we take it from there. Mm. Maybe I'll have a written bass line. I sometimes do that as well, yeah. but. Uh, and then, and then, then we just play it. I mean, and evolve on it because with yes, of course, there is. Even though I bring in a song, there's always going to be an element of them interpreting that and finding. And it's very important that you find the people who can interpret it in, in sort of in the right way and mm -hmm. have an idea about how you work with that. I think, but I think actually that must be true for any kind of music, by the way. Yeah, I mean, so, so, so that's. That's basically how it is and how that works. And then, I mean, recording it, it's really just a live recording. Yeah. And then um, sometimes you will go in and you can, of course, fix stuff if there's something that went wrong. 
But in most cases, with the kind of budget that we work with, we don't really have time to do it. We have like one or two days in the studio, right. and then the album has to be done. Right. So we might do a bit, a bit of that. Uh, with um, with Trabin, we made three albums, and they're very different because the first one is an album with a lot of Scandinavian folk music that I arranged. And then the second album is more like, it's mostly my compositions. And then it's um, more like a modern jazz thing, sort of mainstream modern jazz. And then the third album is in a period where I was messing around with mixing some more rock influences into it and trying to get get that in there. And that, that's some different kind of composition also because the, the second album has all the extended chords and all the Wayne Shorter harmony modal thing happening. Mm. And that is there on the third one as well, but a lot of it is triads and a lot more riff based. And sometimes it doesn't have harmony in that way. It will have just a riff or a bass line or so. So that's a little bit sort of different yeah. in that way. In that way, the, the three albums are quite different. And with the third album, because we were working with that and, and the guy we worked with who recorded it, he also said, well, you should consider uh, doubling up on on some of the riff parts, and also we try. We actually also try to double up the saxophone parts in some places. That sounded so strange. Yeah. <laughs> that we didn't. Mm-hmm. So, but because it's also, and because it's also, it still has to be. Uh, it still has to be live, and then that means that sometimes the solo just sucks. <laughs> That's just how I have solos on all albums that I really hate, yeah. and it's really funny when when you then have people going like, "Man, that's my favorite solo." <laughs> but that's yeah you know yeah. that taste well, and and also of course uh, it is what it's it's like you know it's live music and yeah. and the good thing about jazz is it's even if it's on a record it's just a moment and you have to remember that it's just a moment yeah. and then sometimes stuff doesn't work out the way you want it to yeah. but and of course sometimes you will also cook you can go in and change things as well we did i think i have done on the last album, I did do one solo over also, just like this needs to be different to get this whole, because the rest of the band is playing better. If I fix this solo so that I'm more happy with it, mm. the whole thing is better. But in general, because yeah, the interaction is so important. And that was, uh, so, so especially how I interact with the drummer, it's really important and it's difficult to to do another take and get the interaction right where it doesn't clash and actually with the solo that i did over the engineer was really like amazed at how that still managed to work between me and but i, I have a really really good connection with this drama so that's the, i think that has to do with that we yeah. and also we just played a lot together yeah, that's fantastic especially when you put so much emphasis on the drama that you know it's important that you have that relationship with them yeah definitely yeah very but i think it's a it's a dynamics thing uh, when you play jazz music then the, the way, at least the way that I mostly play, and also the, the music that I listen to, we of course have a soloist who's soloing on top of something, but what is happening under the soloist is the combination of how the chord instrument and the drummer decide that the dynamics and the mood is, and whether it has to be open, whether it has to be a groove. Of course, the bass player is in there as well, but usually, from my uh, feeling, it's it's me connecting with the drummer. And that's also what I, if I listen to, um, to piano players, I think actually for that, I get most of my inspiration from piano players more than I get from guitar players. So if you have Herbie Hancock and Tony Williams, or if you have McCoy Tyner and Elvin Jones, so to take sort of the the huge giants of this kind of playing, then that's where that happens, you know, where you, um, where you really have that connection that, that they will, especially with, with Herbie and Tony Williams, you can really hear how they will, take a song and it will have all sorts of stories happening throughout the, the uh, rendition of, of Stella by Starlight or something like that. It will go from ballad to 3-4 to double time to quadruple time and back within a solo. And then the next solo gets a different kind of thing. And that's that's really where we're coming from. You don't really hear that so much on the records, but you will hear that live. Yeah. And you can also hear it. I think there are places you can hear it also on live videos from us. That we really do try to change the the mood and the feel, and that's about that connection that you have, have the possibility to go in different places. That all of a sudden, the beginning of my solo, which is really like 
on a on a waltz is a hip hop piece because the drummer can change it into that, yeah. and we can still figure out where we are, hopefully. <laughs> and what about a fourth album? That's uh, right now. It's been so that both me and the saxophone player have been really busy with like I've been busy with the online thing, yeah. and I also working more at the conservatory. So I haven't been doing so much. I've written quite a lot of music. And then I'm hoping that I have time to start working on it soon. Okay. So I haven't, I haven't been, been really trying to, uh, to work with that yet. So the fourth album is still going to be like a good one and a half year away. Okay. All right. And when you, when you, so when you actually sit down and you say a year and a half away, so let's just say this time next year, when you actually sit down to come up con with concepts or ideas with for an album, uh, what does your process look like? How do you how do you come up with your ideas? Do you do you specifically go after a certain sound, or do you rely more on inspiration, or maybe just kind of just shoot in the dark and go after it? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know. I think I mean I think I think I really just rely on what I'm busy with, and then it probably turns out that most of the time when I'm writing music if i write the same the music in one period i'm gonna be into the same thing kind of a little bit it's gonna be related like that and then of course you always have more music than what you record mm -hmm. and in that process you're just gonna throw away the stuff that doesn't work right. uh, and i also on a jazz album it, it should you are you have a, a wide range of possibilities i think you you can allow yourself to go in many directions mm -hmm. and, and, and actually have a really sort of wide range of different kinds of pieces also so so it doesn't have to be the same in that way but but i think i just rely on ideas that i come up with and and it's good also because live it's good that everything is that there are different things like we had a piece uh, of the third album uh, which is actually the, the title piece called looking at the storm mm -hmm. where the melody that me and the saxophone player are playing is in a way the accompaniment for the solo of the bass player and the drummer while we're just playing the melody. So we had this, we sort of turned it a whole, the whole thing around. And then we had sort of this really sort of slow atmospheric melody with, with a sort of open mood to it. And then, then we had all this chaos and the sounds under it and, and lots of dynamics and stuff like that. And that's just a nice song to also have in the set because it's just always a change up whatever you played before. It's never like that because there's always going to be a tempo or there's always going to be oh, there's a tempo on that one but it's always like a spelled out groove or something so i think i've started thinking more in terms of live sets actually to mm -hmm. to not have the same song all the time and also just to make it interesting for the audience that we're always changing things up right do you have any things that you do outside of music like i know you have kids do you have do you cook or have any other quirky hobbies that <laughs> you'd be willing to share with the world um well i don't have so much i mean since i have kids then i don't have so much time anymore i, uh -huh. I do have sort of a, a danish uh emphasis on on, on food uh -huh. <laughs> and so so food is part of my culture so so in that way cooking is i'm not a especially good cook but i do cook and i, I do take that kind of seriously um and then for the rest i used to watch a lot of horror movies but I don't really get around to it anymore. <laughs> so, so when I have time, I'll, I'll watch a horror movie. But it used to be something that I would also just do with, 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 with my friends. Like the, the, I guess there's also like a connection between the metal and the horror somehow. Because my, my Swedish friend, the, the drummer, uh, was also like really a horror connoisseur. So he also had all the important horror movies. <laughs> And another friend of mine also was into this. So we just watched a lot of horror movies together. But now we're like kind of spread out across Europe. So we don't really do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, but I still, I mean, I still watch a good movie once in a while. That, that's about it. Really. And for the rest, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly just working. <laughs> what, what is Danish food like? What would be a couple dishes that, if someone was to want to eat Danish food, what would be the main couple dishes you'd recommend? I think the Danish, so the Danish food in itself is, is not that especially interesting. I think that's more about similar to Italian food that you're just trying to make it, make the food yourself, that you're using 
uh, good raw materials. So you need to, need to just make sure you get some, if it's meat, you need to get good meat, you need to get good basic stuff. And for the rest, it's just similar to, um, to German food with meat and potatoes. And uh, it's, it's, it's really middle of the road in many ways. It's just, it, but again, it's also like the kind of thing where you can do that. Well, you can, you can do even simple things well. And, and, and also just not buy everything ready-made. Right. I think in Holland, there's a much more of a tradition, uh, not tradition, but there's tendency to just go much more out to eat and also get much, a lot of ready-made food. And we don't, yeah, I, I try to teach my kids to also learn how to cook. That's great. I think, it, I think, actually, I think it's healthier also. I think there's, it's always going to be a bunch of stuff in the stuff you buy that's already made. Preservatives and... Yeah. Yeah, processed foods. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. But I don't, I mean, I don't really have, I think I don't really have too much in terms of hobbies because I get to do, the, the cliche is of course that I made my hobby my job. Huh? <laughs> so I get to do that. I just work really well. <laughs> but I like what I do and that's, that's cool. That's great. And, and it shows on camera, honestly, it does. Oh, thanks. Well, thank you so much for coming. This has been wonderful. Uh, do you have any final questions, Aaron? No, I'm... I'm, this has been great. I, I've had a ball. Jens, thank you so much for, for coming on Prep Buzz the Podcast. It's, it's been great. Well, thanks for having me. I'll, um, I'll of course, share this out to, to, my, uh, to my following, and uh, you will have uh, hopefully some new listeners, at least, because I've, I've been checking out quite a lot of your, your stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's, a, there's a, some really nice sort of discussions. And also, you just let it flow, you know? The, the, the discussions get to go in different places, and you really cover a lot of drama. That's what's really cool. Thank so, you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, thank you. Do you. Would you like to plug your website and your YouTube channel and anything else? I think, I mean, if you want to know what I do and what, what people will know me for, then it's the YouTube channel. So that's um, essentially just Jens Larsen, uh, youtube.com slash Jens Larsen, if I remember, remember correctly. Otherwise, just search for Jens Larsen. Mm -hmm. we'll do that. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Thanks, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Bye. Have a good day. Yeah, you too. Bye.